waitress at the time. And then finally, my last interview was with Larry. And so, you know, literally, I just came in one day and actually got to sit down in Larry Page's office and, uh, and interview with him. And he asked me a bunch of tough questions, and uh, I didn't, didn't quite know how I did, but, uh, but apparently he liked me enough to, to the point where they decided to give me an offer. Among the most highly prized employees at Google, just after computer science engineers, are new hires called APMs, or Associate Product Managers. A large part of why Google hired associates like my position, associate product managers out of school at that point, um, was to be able to culture these future product managers like myself in the way Google wanted them to behave. Mostly young, recent graduates with incredibly high test scores, they are given enormous amounts of responsibility and authority early in their career. And it's we're not prioritizing that very hard right now because we don't think it's gonna be able to replace the personal start page from day one. Among the most recent crop of APMs is a Canadian, Jeff Harris. The job that I'm actually doing, which is an associate product manager, is kind of designed for people that have a technical background but aren't necessarily interested in coding day to day. So what my job ends up being is communicating with the engineers who do code all the time and kind of just making sure that all the engineers are working together towards the same goal. So I'm just turned 22. I think the biggest surprise that working at Google is probably how open it is about everything that we're doing. So I can just look it up on our internal site and see details on every single project that's out there, which is, which is great from an organizational perspective. Although Google might be highly transparent internally, it, like so many of the other big Silicon Valley high-tech companies, is extremely sensitive about what outsiders are allowed to report on, whether that be code on monitor screens or the doodles on the whiteboards, which are seemingly everywhere. We believe in having whiteboards all over the place, and the reason for that is to really spur creativity uh, so that, you know, you can, you can draw things and communicate ideas and, and work with other people on that idea. The secure data connector here, right? Is our ability to publish programmatically going to be released at the same time, or is that...? Yeah. And so a lot of times people will pull out their phone and take a picture of the whiteboard and send that around as an email. You know, those end up being part of the notes for the meeting. Besides having whiteboards and food stands everywhere, the other striking feature about Google offices is the absence of paper. Uh, we operate very much in, in a paperless manner. You know, one of the things that we've done here at Google is that users have laptops that they carry with them to the meetings that they're in. A lot of the note-taking is done electronically so that it can be instantly shared with people. An insatiable appetite for the new and innovative spanning a wide spectrum of technologies means Google is constantly on the prowl. But not everything, of course, is invented at Google. We also have teams looking for great technology in small companies that we can pick up, that we can buy, where they would benefit from the structure of Google. With plenty of cash and stock at its disposal, Google is able to scoop up companies it's interested in. That's how YouTube became a Google product, as did Google Earth and Picasso, as well as a web-based word processing program called Rightly. Rightly was a word processor in the browser. You just go to it as a normal website and it just works. Google noticed it because we were you know, getting a little bit of press. Google bought Rightly and hired its founders to help develop it further. <laughs> My experience has been a little bit like I was a kid folding up little paper boats in a stream somewhere, and it was really fun, and, you know, Daddy Warbucks wandered by and said, kid, this is great. Here's a pile of quarter-inch thick plate steel and an army of arc welders. Go build me a battalion of battleships. Rightly has morphed into Google Docs, a word processor that moves the application and its data from the personal desktop computer to Google's servers. It, it's a little bit strange. It is strange. I'm definitely, a, you know, I'm a 42-year-old graybeard now, right? Like, it's kind of, I'm not that old, but it, here, that's 90th percentile or something. I don't know what it is, but, yeah, there's a lot of young engineers here. Um, that, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I think it's, it's interesting to me. I think I've, everybody gets to this point.
their career where things begin to seem obvious. I don't mind the technical culture here. I'm not intimidated by it. I'm a very productive, fierce kind of meat-eating coder when I'm writing code, and they're all afraid of me, so I don't, they don't bother me. I wasn't here when they founded it, but my understanding of the founding conception of the culture is they wanted to do things and see things from an engineer's perspective. We do have a lot of people from that perspective, efficiency might very well be an engineer's prime directive. Right now I'm looking at the one where you open a text document in Gmail and it gives an error. Most of the teams do this every morning. There's a stand-up meeting. It's meant to be very short. It's about 10 minutes long. You're, you're not supposed to speak for more than about a minute. All right, so I continue unit testing. The, the pencil is the conch shell from the Lord of the Flies. Remember that? Like, so that's the whoever has the pencil is talking. That's why it's a very efficient meeting. It took five minutes to tell the whole team what was going on. Another meeting where members of the Google Docs team get to discuss problems is during their weekly rightly walk. I think it's interesting to try to do big things that change the world. I think that's what I like about being at Google. We want to change the world, too. We want to do great things. What's wrong with the logarithmic pruning that we do now? The guy was editing for eight cool. hours, and All right. the, the beginning and the end got pruned. So we were that's that's we're using it. Okay. It. No, no, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. You get to deal with tens of millions of users and, you know, big data centers and big machines and big engineering, and it's really fun. For computer geeks, the fun really began in 1977 in a Silicon Valley garage when two college dropouts started a company called Apple and launched a revolution, the personal computer revolution. The power of the desktop computer unleashed across millions of homes and offices around the world changed everything. But now, after more than a quarter of a century of insinuating itself into our lives, the PC has lost pretty well all of its original gee whiz luster. Google has set its sights on creating another revolution by eliminating the need for desktop computers. It wants to put as much of that data as possible onto its own servers. One of the things I think that's underappreciated is from the very earliest days, including at Stanford, they were great at minimizing the cost for putting together computer systems and they've carried on that ability to, de to deliver a huge amount of computing power uh, at a relatively low cost. From its beginnings Google had made it a priority to manufacture as cheaply as possible all its servers and storage facilities to handle its fast search and logging of the internet. And as the internet has grown so has a need for increased computing capacity. When Google builds large data centers, we use personal computer components, and then we build a lot of specialized systems now to deal with the kind of scale that is required. Scale is at the heart of Google. Not only does Google have access to almost limitless computer power, but perhaps of greater value, it has accumulated a massive collection of data data that can be used for testing at a scale unseen by most new computer engineers. My office mate and I were just banting around some ideas and, and we're talking about uh, something that later turned into something close to Google Bookmarks. And, you know, we did a little bit of math and said, hmm, that'll be about, I don't know, four petabytes of data. That doesn't seem so bad. And, and that sentence, four petabytes of data, that doesn't seem so bad, is something that before I had been at Google for a month, I, I would have been shocked to hear those words coming out of my mouth. That shocking four petabytes is the equivalent of four million gigabytes, numbers so staggeringly large that it is nearly impossible for mere mortals to fathom. As memory increases in capacity and decreases in price, Google is moving into something called cloud computing. The whole idea behind cloud computing is to go ahead and get everything on their server where the professionals are managing it. The problem today is you've got all your stuff on your computer, you drop it, you break it, you delete it, it's a disaster. Why don't you put everything that's important somewhere else, keep it secure, keep it under your control, and it's available to you on every demand, on every device, and every, everywhere you are. The move to the cloud is ushering in a revolution in how we communicate, how we work, how we play, in fact, how we live. People wonder, what's going to happen to information that is 
mine personally. It's my bank records, my health records, whatever it is. Uh, but I don't control it. I, it's sitting out there somewhere on, I have to just trust whoever has it to not do things with it I wouldn't want. Is this move into the clouds opening a back door for governments and corporations to secretly access data about us? If everyone's digital data is moving into computer clouds, just where are these clouds? One of them has touched down in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. This was once the heartland of American furniture manufacturing. Then in the 1990s, cheap labor from overseas siphoned off the jobs, leaving behind a devastated economy and an awful lot of excess electricity. It just so happens that computer data centers are voracious users of electricity to run the servers and to cool vast quantities of water used for refrigeration. The town of Lenore had plenty of both. And so in late 2005, Google came calling, but it came cloaked in secrecy. From Google's perspective, at least as I understood it, it was that um, the race to build these data centers is so intense and the information, at least they see it, is so proprietary um, that they didn't want any of their competitors to get wind of what they were doing. T.J. Rohr is a lawyer and a member of the Lenore City Council who was involved in the closed-door negotiations with Google. They would reveal information to us that we couldn't reveal to anyone else. Google definitely had an attitude like, look, it's our way or the highway. This is the term we're, these are the terms we're offering. Take them or leave them. Desperate local and state officials were more than ready to reach a deal that would bring Google to this devastated county. They offered Google a 30-year tax break on property and equipment. It was worth an estimated $165 million over a 30-year period. From these digital warehouses estimated to cost $600 million apiece, flows a stream of data. Here are the emails, the photographs, the music, the videos, the maps, and the searches that have made Google a data collecting powerhouse. Google does not divulge how many server farms it runs worldwide, but it is rumored that there are some three dozen of them around the globe, all digitally connected and all firmly planted on land. But that might change. Google has filed a patent to build data centers out on the open sea. Powered by the latest technologies in harnessing wave energy, Google servers would sit out on barges. The expectation is that seabound servers would be much cheaper to run, and there certainly wouldn't be any real estate or property taxes to pay. A working model has yet to be built, but Google is a corporation that likes to move quickly when cutting-edge technology is involved. However, Google took its time when it came to opening up an office in China. The growth in internet usage in China is staggering. By 2009, its internet users surpassed the entire population of the United States. It is an exploding market made more complex by a censorious government. We were late in entering China. We were late because we were concerned about some of their content laws. In order for Google to set up an office in China, it had to agree to block certain sites from its search results. The Chinese government decides who gets past their Chinese firewall. To run Google in China, they landed Kai Fu Li, a senior executive at Microsoft, who was once in charge of their operations in China. In 2005, Kai Fu Li found himself in the role of Noogler, as new Googlers are called. When I joined Google, I used the word shock to describe what I felt I saw. And I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of the Google values. And that's just how young and happy this company was. It's my goal to make the culture in the Google China office as close as possible to that of Google Mountain View office. It's impossible to make it exactly the same because the Chinese culture and the American cultures are different. Nothing separates these two cultures more than who is actually using the internet. 
the average internet user is 25 years old in China versus about 42 in the United States. So the difference is uh, substantial, and the usage patterns is also quite different. They, the Chinese users, because they're younger, tend to like entertainment, uh, games, music, video, uh, tend to do less of searching and e-commerce. Uh, similarly, when they use the web, they tend to want something that's very busy, very, um, very exciting, as opposed to simple user interfaces. The internet cafes are filled with young people, many of whom are here because at home they would be forbidden to play these games and movies. What it seems is not forbidden, either here or at home, is downloading pirated music. We noticed that uh, most Chinese users on the internet download pirated or unlicensed music through other search engines. And um, that's become a habit, and I think most users find